Good morning, and welcome to St. Paul, United Church of Christ, Keokuk. Um, I run across people all week who have various concerns and that sort of thing, and, and you really become aware that we need to reach out uh, into all the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ in order to uh, help people, to calm their spirits, all that sort of thing. That's what your pennies do. That's what those pennies do. The reason I encourage you to get your pennies from home is that often they're sitting there without doing anything. And uh, those jars sit around forever. Okay, very good. Did you bring that jar all the way back there? Yeah. Okay, very good. And you serve God that way, which is very good too. All right. Have you ever been in a scary place? Hmm? You ever scared of the dark? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you've been scared of the dark. Mm -hmm. Well, what we sung today uh, was about moment by moment. Moment by moment, we rely on God walking by our side. So if we're in a really scary, dark place, what do we rely on? And then it's a haunted house. Yeah. <laughs> in a haunted house, we it's rely... It's very dark. And it's very dark. And we're scared, we reach out, and who's there? Who's going to help us when we're scared? Um, the old man. <laughs> the old man. Well, sometimes God is pictured as an old man, but God is there with us, right? Walking with us, moment by moment, when scary things jump out at us. Mm -hmm. So... One of the things you have to remember is that you're never alone, that God is always with you. God is always with you, even when you're scared, okay? So you reach out, and who's there? Who's there? Um, God. 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 So, yeah, God is there. All right. So you reach out, who's there? God. That's right. God is always there to walk with you. So that's something always to remember, okay? I once saw a kid in a uh, mall and they had lost track of their parents and they were crying and crying and crying and crying, but God was there. God was there, nevertheless, found their parents and uh, they were not alone. But in the crowd, sometimes that can happen. Remember, you are always walking close with God. Let us pray together. Lord, Lord we thank you. We thank you. That you walk close <laughs> with us. With us. Amen. Amen. Okay, very good. During this time of year and as we go into February, we think about purification. February really comes from a word that means purification. And one of the ways in which uh, <clears throat> we symbolize that is through baptism. And the baptism of Christ is one in which uh, the Spirit came down upon Christ in a powerful way. And as the Spirit came down, uh, God spoke and said, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. So let's consider the Spirit for a little while and how we're baptized in the Spirit Spirit is often associated with a great deal of enthusiasm, so we began the service today with the harmonica, which was pretty enthusiastic and pretty lively, and uh, that's kind of the way the Spirit is. It's very dynamic, it's very unpredictable, and that's why it's often uh, compared to the wind, because you never know where the wind is going to go. The eaves of the parsonage, for example, have a kind of... Uh, uh, some sort of relationship with the wind where you can uh, hear the wind howl around the eaves sometimes. And it's kind of a low howl, and when it was very cold, I thought to myself, boy, you know, the wind is a good comparison to the spirit because you just never know where it's going to pop up among people. And I've seen it pop up among people in unpredictable ways. It's like, it's like a storm almost. Um, when the wind comes around and, and begins to swirl, the spirit is like that, and it moves things and it changes things. I remember 
when um, the tree was ripped out of the front of the church there, that little tree, and uh, it hit a sign. And uh, about the time that that happened, I was looking out, looking at the storm. You know, when you have a tornado warning, you don't go inside. Uh, you're supposed to. That'd be the best way to, thing to do. But instead, you go out and look to see whether or not the tornado is coming. Well, of course, by the time it hits, you don't have time to do anything. But I noticed uh, there was wind coming through the side of the, by the side of the parsonage that looked a lot like a, a tornado. And I, uh, I yelled to Kim for us to go to the basement, and we ran into the basement. And that was about the time that that tree got torn up out of the ground and, and took down a sign. Unpredictable, powerful, a powerful agent of change. My mother was always afraid of storms. She was afraid of storms because she was once in one of them and the wind was very powerful and very unpredictable too, this wind that we compare to the spirit. And uh, it happened to be a tornado and she remembered in the old farms they had storm cellars, you know, that you went into the ground and there was a door that closed and she remembered the door was still open and her sister was coming down into the storm cellar and behind her, she could see a big black funnel cloud coming in. And then the uh, storm hit, and she remembered very distinctly that uh, she, the men were trying to hold the door closed because of the tremendous suction that it, it involved, and they were really straining to hold the door of that storm cellar closed. And she remembered when she finally got out and the storm had passed, that the grove was completely torn, torn apart. I mean, the, the limbs and everything were just stripped from the trees, and there were straws driven into fence posts, and the cattle, of course, had been hit by all sorts of projectiles, like two-by-fours, all sorts of things that had just gone right through them. So whenever there was a dark cloud, she was always afraid of the storm because <clears throat> of the very unpredictable and very powerful wind but the wind of the Spirit, the wind of the Spirit is unpredictable and powerful in a constructive way, not a destructive way. The wind of the Spirit is a powerful agent of change among us. It's able to change our hearts, it's able to do all sorts of things, and it, it actually was a powerful agent of change for the disciples. Listen to what happened at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. We see from this passage a powerful and violent wind. There was a lot of power, a lot of power for change within that wind. We see then that God, the Spirit of God, is a powerful agent for change. Things don't stay the same when the Spirit of God is moving about. When the Spirit of God moves about, there's a lot of change brought on. Sometimes that change appears in the midst of wind and fire. Sometimes it comes in the form of a dove, like we see in the windows here, in the dove that visited Jesus when he was baptized. One common denominator is that if the Spirit of God is moving around, then things are likely to change, and they're likely to change in a very constructive way. God can make things through the movement of the Spirit that we would imagine would be impossible to make. Jesus spoke of the temple being broken down and God being able to rebuild it in, in a short period of time. When the Spirit moves, there are so many things that happen, so many things that are possible, so many things that are powerfully done. Jesus brought about change. Jesus was an agent of change. Now, the world as it was probably didn't like that very much. Herod was not a very, very good guy. And as a matter of fact, 
he didn't want Jesus to come into the world as king and bring about change. As a matter of fact, when he couldn't find Jesus, he had the children killed in a broad area who might have been about the age of Jesus so that he might be able to catch Jesus in that net. And Jesus and his parents had to escape uh, to Egypt. Some of the world doesn't want change. Sometimes we react to change because we like things to stay the same, but the thing is that things never stay the same. There's an old philosopher by the name of Heraclitus, for example, who said the only constant in this world is change. The only constant in this world is change, and God is always working within us to change things. And so in our modern world, God is working to change things. God may be working to change the church, because for so many years, the church has been able to get along because there were plenty of people who had a lot of children, sometimes filling a whole pew. I remember in northwest Iowa, growing up in the church there, there was more than one family that fill a whole pew in a church. More than one family that fill a whole pew. But maybe God is bringing a change now. And this is under that category of discipleship in the template for church redevelopment that we have here. Maybe God is make, bringing a change now through the Spirit where the church has moved to reach out into the community and bring people in and invite people in. Maybe God is saying there's a great, there's a great crop out there, but we have few laborers to bring people in, few laborers who are speaking few laborers who are going out to talk to people about the saving grace that I have given in Jesus Christ, maybe God is bringing about through the Spirit a great change in the church where we have a renewed mission within us to bring people into the church, to bring people into the church who need to hear about the love of God. Jesus brought about change. And if Jesus were walking among us today, if Jesus were walking among us teaching, and if Jesus were going to denominational meetings and hearing denominations sometimes talk about um, maybe to decrease numbers in some churches, if they, he were hearing that, do you know what Jesus would likely say? Jesus would likely say the Spirit of God is a powerful thing. Where, where has the mission been to go out into all the world and preach the gospel? The, the fields are ripe for the harvest. My church is there to do this, to go out, to reach out to people who are in need and, and who need care, the caring of the church. This is what we're here for. Jesus might say, look at the fields. Walk into those fields. Reach out to people. They're there. There are people all over the place. There are people all over the place. And that's what Jesus did. Because the message of John the Baptist and the message of Jesus was to repent and believe the gospel. It was that simple. That was their message that they brought into the world. That's the message we bring into the world. Repent and believe the gospel. And they went outside the church to do that. They went outside the existing church of that day. They went into the world and they said, repent and believe the gospel. And people did believe and people did come. And that's what we do as well. That is what we do as well through the strength of the Spirit. So when Jesus started his ministry, he began to call people to service. And he began to speak to people about how their needs might be met. He is casually going along and uh, he needs a drink of water and there's a woman at the well. And he says to her, <clears throat> you know, what are you doing? Well, I'm drawing water from the well. Well, he says, I can give you water so that you'll never thirst again. And the woman says, well, how can you do that? Well, he says, uh, I know that 
you have not been able to find satisfaction in your life. You've been in many relationships and you haven't been able to find anything in your life. And I can give you something that will ultimately give you what you need, a, a living water, so that you will never thirst again. So that you will never thirst again. There are many people like that out in the world right now. There are many people like that who have a need that they have not been able to satisfy. They have a kind of a space within them that only God can occupy. It's often been spoken of in literature that people have a space within them that only God can occupy. In recovery circles, when I was taking care of people who had substance abuse problems, we called it a God-shaped hole. And only God could fit there. But people need to know, they need to be led into um, how to get, that, uh, how to get that, that hole filled. In addicts, for example, it would be filled with various things. Alcohol, it would be filled with meth, or it would be filled with many other things. And when we go out and preach the gospel, when we make disciples of all people, what happens is that they say, yes. Yes, I feel fulfilled now. I know that I was missing something, but I had not heard what it was. I had not heard what it was. I was filled with anxiety. I just, I just felt full of anxiety and didn't really know. I tried to fill it with various things. After I got done working during the day, I, I'd go home and mix a strong drink because I wanted to forget about all of the anxieties I had during that day. I wanted to have something that would give me comfort. Or I went home and I had trouble going to sleep because of all the problems that I had that day and I felt very much alone. And we come and say, well, there's an emptiness within you. And God can fill that em emptiness. You can go home at night when there are things that you're worried about and say to God, I trust you, God. I trust you. And the anxiety begins to melt away because you are not alone. How many people have that kind of feeling these days that we can reach out to and we can bring change? The kind of change that Jesus brought when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well. The kind of change which comes with the visitation of the Spirit. If we, if we follow the guidance of the Spirit, we will reach out to people in various ways to bring that change about, and they can find the comfort that that change can bring. Sometimes people speak of the winds of change. They spoke of it when John the Baptist was there. The religious leaders who came to watch Jesus be baptized also came because they noticed the winds of change. They wanted to find out what was going on they were concerned sometimes about their own power like Herod was. Change was taking place. People's hearts were going to change and they wanted them to change in the right way. If you were in power, they want, you wanted them to change in the right way. So it was sometimes a threat to you. But Jesus came and people's hearts changed and people were finding that they were finding that emptiness within them filled. And as they did, they followed Jesus. The winds of change. The winds of change. Now Jesus would be baptizing with the Holy Spirit and with fire because he was bringing about that change in the hearts of people. That change which brings us here today sitting in this church. John the Baptist baptized him and uh, as he did, he was aware that Jesus was worthy. And he said he was more worthy than he. As a matter of fact, he didn't feel worthy to baptize him. But when he did, Jesus 
had a dove come down upon him. And here we have the flame and the dove of the Holy Spirit for Pentecost. And here we have the dove coming down. Again, the spirit that brings change. The change that we can tell people about. And here we have Jesus, the worthy lamb, who died on our behalf. One of the greatest momentous things in history is that Jesus died on our behalf. We want to tell everybody about that in order that the Spirit might work powerfully in our world. Why is discipleship a part of church renewal, a part of church redevelopment? It's a part of it because it is essential. It is essential. We can find ways in which we can, through our mission as a church, begin to try to identify people who need to hear about the Word of God that we can reach out to, and that sort of thing. People who may be part of the church fellowship at some time. Now, the Spirit comes with winds of change, but it also comes to purify. It comes to purify the intent of our hearts and to focus us. Fire can do that, you know. The fire is also associated with uh, the spirit as well as wind. Fire can purify. And as our, as our intentions become purified, we bring about change that is purifying, fertile, and full. Because we're baptized with the same spirit that baptized Jesus. The Spirit helps us to do what Jesus asked us to do, reach out to other people and make them disciples. Our intents and our purposes as a church become pure. We intentionally do this all the time. Now, I have a, that template for church redevelopment that I uh, handed out to you, and part of it is discipleship. When we meet in the consistory, we ask ourselves, what have we done? Is there anybody that we can contact? Or we'll be asking ourselves, is there anybody we can contact in relation to people who might become associated with the church or might have drifted away and that sort of thing? It's an intentional thing. It's something that we do because that's who we are. And what the fire of the Spirit does is, is purify things down to the basic level. And the basic level is we reach out to other people and tell them the good news of the gospel. That's discipleship. That's what we do. That's why we're here. <clears throat> Sometimes when uh, I ask somebody what they do, they say, what, they say what their profession is, and they say, and that's what I do. And I think to myself, well, you know, we know what believers do, what we do is reach out to other people. Think within yourself. Think to yourself who you might ask to come to church, who you might have who might want to know uh, the power of the Spirit within their lives, who you know who might have an empty spot in their life that, that they would like to uh, have filled, that sort of thing, so that the Spirit might work dynamically within this fellowship. The, Baptist, the baptism that Jesus brought about for us, is one in which we are part of that harvest. We are part of the harvest of people who would believe in Jesus Christ and have the emptiness within us filled. Jesus said, the, the fields are full. And pray that there might be laborers for the harvest. I want to talk to a friend of mine recently about <clears throat> a small church somewhere that apparently the pastor was trying to retire but they couldn't seem to find anybody else. And I said, well, what in the world is happening here? Uh, I said, surely there must be somebody. No, they couldn't find anybody else. They just couldn't find anybody to be a pastor there. And I thought to myself, well, gee, you know, here we have these fields so ripe for the harvest and we, we don't have enough pastors. We don't have enough pastors, and there weren't, they couldn't even find a lay, uh, they couldn't find a lay pastor either. And I think to myself, well, you know, 
God is speaking to us through this. God is speaking to us for, for each of us to take on a pastoral responsibility and, and, uh, and reach out. And, and, and for me, as a pastor, maybe to try to help them find, you know, somebody who will serve them uh, in their congregation. So I suggested a few possibilities to people who, who are looking for a laborer, uh, say, to lead their church. I know some people, but they were all occupied. Again, we don't have enough pastors. Well, that means that we have an opportunity. The opportunity is that we each take responsibility for being a disciple, speaking to dis people and discipling them, and also uh, that we encourage people to go into the pastorate because we have a world that is full of people who have that emptiness in their lives. Sometimes they fill the emptiness with chemicals, sometimes they fill it with other substances, but you know that they're out there. You know that they're out there. And so we have a burden for souls, you might say. Spirit helps us do what Jesus asked us to do, reach out to other people and make them disciples. The same Spirit that baptized Jesus into his ministry is the Spirit that baptized us into ministry, to reaching out to other people. Discipleship is very important. Jesus focused on that. He'd look over the crowds. Listen to what we see in the Bible. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. When we do as Jesus asked us to do, we fill the void in people. Henry David, Henry David Thoreau, somebody who some of you may know in history, believed that most people have a void in their lives that they desperately try to fill with money and other things. In relation to this, he said the following, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. And when you're with God and you walk with God, you're not desperate anymore. When you walk with God, that desperation is filled with the comfort that God gives you. These thinkers also said, God exists, so we don't need to go to all the trouble of trying to invent a God, but people try to invent a God to fill that void all the time. They try to do it. Thoreau, somebody named Voltaire, Notice that void in people. Jesus fills that void. We have a harvest out there. We have a lot of people out there who have a void. Sometimes when I'm kicking along the parking lot or something out in that direction, I come across uh, what is called a, a, a blunt. It's basically a, a cigar that's been hollowed out and filled with marijuana. People use marijuana as a sed sedative. So somebody parked there and, and used some sedative. God is the greatest sedative that the world ever had because God is what really we need. It's what, it's what that person needed. It's what everyone needs. It is not natural for us not to have a relationship with God. And so that's why Henry David Thoreau said, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Let's help people with that desperation. Let's invite them to church. And their lives will go better. Their lives will go better because they have the comfort of God and they have that empty space filled. Amen. You have been listening to St. Paul United Church of Christ, 2030 Plank Road, Keokuk. Join our worship service at 10 a.m. with fellowship hour immediately following. 
Until next week, may God bless.